Welcome to PAC TV Community News. I'm Zach Dolan. And I'm Julie Thompson. On tonight's show, we welcome Mike Gamaris of Remax Spectrum on set to talk about the housing market and learn about the $3 million MassWorks infrastructure grant awarded to the town of Kingston. We wrap up Kingston Town Meeting for our government update and check in on two local events celebrating our veterans. We meet Robin Kernan, Pembroke Veterans Agent and Commander of American Legion Post 143, and air a special thank you to veterans recorded by students for Laker TV. And Plymouth Town Manager Melissa Arrighi is on set to discuss what's next for the town. But we start tonight's show in Plymouth. West Plymouth is one of several villages of Plymouth, and its steering committee took a break from their usual workload of reviewing permits and tracking down new developments to host a logo contest. PCN met up with the committee and the winners at a recent planning board meeting to see the winning entries. The role of the steering committee um, is to be a support for the planning board. The planning board um, has so much area to cover because Plymouth is so huge. There's five villages that have been set up within Plymouth and each one has a steering committee and we all perform the same functions. And the steering committee um, handles the village of West Plymouth and what we do is we review different projects that come before the board, usually those with special permits. Plus we have a master plan and we implement the master plan. Two years ago, the West Plymouth Steering Committee completed their master plan. And one of the recommendations was that we establish an identity for West Plymouth. In other words, who is West Plymouth? Why are we special? And also to build community, to give us an identity and a sense of belonging. So we instituted this logo contest and we put it out to all the citizens in West Plymouth. We work with the school department and many different entities and we ask people to submit what they think is special about West Plymouth and to do it visually, something that's representative so that we can all look at it and think, that's West Plymouth. Tonight is our award ceremony. We have four finalists and we have some wonderful presentations. We have ranked them. We did voting through our Facebook page and we actually had the public help us decide the winner. Um, we also have three honorable mention um, people that we're going to be giving recognition to tonight. So tonight is our award ceremony and we're going to be letting people know who, where they rank and who the winner is. Well, just the thinking is it's I love to travel and I still find some novelty in driving past the airport to work every day. I like being able to go shopping in a few different places to eat out, but still I live in a quiet neighborhood. It's dead end roads, kids play on the street, they play basketball, the hoops facing the street. So I like that convenience, but still it's a quiet neighborhood. Um, and then this time of year to drive past the cranberry bog, see people harvesting, it's, it's a nice little picture in New England too. So it's a good mixture of things, I just wanted to get all that into one, one logo, one image is best I could. I don't win design contests, I usually don't even bother entering them, so I'm surprised and I'm, I'm eager to surprise my family who's going to be pretty shocked that I won too. Since 2015, the MassWorks program has granted over $275 million to support 138 projects in 106 communities. The town of Kingston was recently awarded a $3 million MassWorks infrastructure grant to expand the town's wastewater treatment plant and water distribution center. PCM was there to learn more. The award that we're making today really isn't an infrastructure grant. It's really a uh, reward uh, to you, the town of Kingston, for what you're doing uh, to plan for your growth, but more importantly, to come together as a community to say that we believe that Kingston can be better, and uh, this is the path that we believe that we should follow uh, to do so. The treatment plan and the water system could result in mixed-use development that's really exciting. In fact, I would uh, venture to say that um, it's, a, um, it's a, uh, a type of development that other communities would want to emulate. Uh, we decided to make 40 awards, and I'll tell you that it wasn't tough to get your award up to the top um, of our list. So our average grant this year is $1.8 million. You're getting three. 
Um, that's how important uh, we think this project is and uh, how much confidence we have in your ability to deliver. So uh, to all the members of the Board of Selectmen, to your town administrator, and especially uh, to uh, your uh, legislative delegation, both former and present, uh, we congratulate you and we're happy to partner with you on what is going to be a great uh, project here in Kingston. This will not be uh, the only time that we'll be here because uh, we plan on staying engaged and helping you to realize uh, the fullest potential for what you can do for Kingston, what you can do for the region, and what you can do for the Commonwealth. So congratulations, everyone. This grant um, is specific for economic development, and Kingston has been lacking that for many years due to our limited wastewater capacity in certain areas of town with the water restrictions. So this grant allows us to invest in that infrastructure, expand the wastewater treatment plant to take on more capacity, increase the pressure at the water mains up at the exit 8 area, which all allows development, um, specific development gone through all the vetting processes in town and the wastewater Treatment plant will allow development that exits 8, 9, and 10, and we actually have property owners currently interested in expanding, and now we can actually have the conversations with them. I'd like to thank um, Secretary Ash and Senator DiMasito, as well as all the um, town boards and committees that helped us get this far. It was a team effort, and we are going to be working even harder to make it a reality. <laughs> We are so pleased to have back on set Mike Gamaris, who is the owner broker of Remax Spectrum here in Plymouth and beyond for our section that we call Home Matters. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Thanks. We haven't had you in a while, so a lot has changed in the market. It certainly has. Seemingly over the last four months or so. Yeah. What, what is the state of the market right now? It's definitely changed. I think we were a broken record for a long time talking yeah. about seller's market. Uh, the prices just increasing very quickly, yep. bidding wars, people yep. feeling, uh, buyers feeling like they needed to rush into the market when a house came on. Right, people That's selling houses changed. like yeah, it in was, 20 seconds. It, it was, was ridiculous. kind of like to put the sign up, it's gone. Right. Um, and that was unhealthy. We, right. we knew that couldn't really be sustained. Yep. And it wasn't good for buyers to feel like they were pressured into a home and, and start bidding more than they really could afford or sure. wanted to spend. Sure. So uh, that has shifted. And we're definitely uh, leaning back towards a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't shifted completely yet. It's, it's a little bit more stable. Um, we had seen uh, price increases of 7 to 10% year over year mm. prior, mm. and now we're expected to see 2 to 3%, which is a much more stable market. So what caused this shift that happened? A lot of global instability. Um, you know, we saw interest rates were starting to increase, yeah. uh, which was expected. Yep. It, it could only go up. And uh, people started getting a little nervous, um, mm -hmm. but the economy is still strong. Yes. And so, you know, Brexit happened. Um, that, that caused a little bit of instability there as well. We saw rates dip again. Yep. And that caused people to maybe feel like they could get back in. Right. Now, what about the whole steel industry, the tariffs? How does that affect everything? It does. It affects uh, new construction mm -hmm. and uh, home modifications or remodeling mm -hmm. more. So we are definitely seeing a price increase in, in new construction properties, okay. uh, which is, is really causing a little bit of an issue for those homes be, being affordable. Right. So you're you're seeing new homes that may have been six fifty to seven hundred thousand in yeah. years past now pushing seven fifty to eight hundred thousand. Wow. Okay, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, do you ever see it going in the opposite direction? Um, the the cost of goods is not going to come right. back. It never really does. Yeah. Um, the years we saw oil spike, mm. we saw those materials go up because of transportation right. um, and plastics that are made from oil based. Right. Um, and then when that, the oil price came down, they didn't reset. Right. So it just continues to move up. Yeah, it never seems to go reset. It doesn't. Yeah. Um, what, what is next for, for consumers? Consumers who are out there looking, should I buy? Is now the right time? I am a first-time home buyer. I mean, there's so many people that are still in that position of being the first-time home buyer that cannot find affordable housing. Absolutely. Talk about that. Yeah, so um, really what's next is, is um, them being prepared for affordability. So first-time home buyers have a lot of programs available to them to yep. purchase a home. And the rates still aren't bad. I mean, we look at what rates were uh, in previous years. We oh, yeah. had topped 17, 18 percent. Yeah, the my 80s. first house, 18 percent. Mine, nine yeah. and three eighths, yeah. and uh, that was only in the 90s. So the rates are still good. Uh, buyers just need to be prepared for affordability. Yep. Um, being realistic about what their payments are going to be, mm -hmm. and then being uh, calm and, and precise about what they're going to search for, not feeling pressured mm -hmm. uh, because that market is not on the seller side now. 
So they need to have a professional do some due diligence on a home they're going to offer on, mm -hmm. um, understand what utility costs are going to be and uh, Taxes other factors. And, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not, just, huge. it's not just the house price anymore. Right. Uh, and especially where homes that have been built in the last 15 years, the energy code is so much better right. that um, larger homes are, are easier to heat and cool. Yep. So it might be less expensive than a home that's 20 years old, even exactly. though the price is higher. Exactly. Now, what, what about um, first-time home buyers and putting deposits down? I mean, because usually it's five or ten percent, and yeah. if you're buying a four hundred thousand dollar house, a lot of people don't have forty thousand dollars sitting Absolutely. in the bank. What? Yeah, yeah. You know, the the uh, old feeling was the more you put down, the stronger your offer. Right. But now with the programs the way they are, there are first time homebuyer programs with zero percent down again. Wow. Three percent down uh, for FHA, and uh, while some people get a little nervous, thinking that that's uh, lending is really laxed a bit. Yeah. Um, it's not like that. Um, they're still very strict on income. Yes. Uh, your time and your employment, yep. things like that. Right. So um, buyers should really take advantage of those programs. There's a lot of mass housing uh, programs that will help you with down payment assistance. Yep. And I think that if buyers look at the cost to rent, mm -hmm. which will continue to increase. And that's a whole other subject. It's not going to stop. Subject. Yeah. So buying is definitely much more affordable in the long run, and you get more of an asset back at the end. Right, because affordable renting, it doesn't even seem to exist anymore. It really doesn't. And I think that we're seeing a lot more 40B projects that are putting in some affordable housing, which is great. Right. But there's so many people that are, are trying to get into those properties exactly. that it's even more competitive than if they look at homes that are in, in the price range that they can And there's afford. not enough of them. There isn't. Yeah, at all. Um, now, what, what, what is ahead for the spring? What do people do December? Like, nobody puts their house on the market in December, do they? Or January? They do. I, I, it really, we, we split the market into a couple segments. So some folks have to move yes, uh, their situation. Right. They yep. need to, to change, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be job or whatever. So those homes will go on the market. Um, the buyers that are looking now in the holiday season are the, the most serious buyers. Yep. And sellers certainly, if they want to get most for their house, uh, want to do that, want to get their home on the market before April 1st, which mm -hmm. is our proverbial spring market. Exactly. Because then they're going to be competing with a lot more homes at that point, and buyers right. will have more options. If sellers want to sell, now is a great time, um, and buyers can be picky. Um, yeah. If we see people out looking now, they're, they're serious, though. So that's, yes. that's a good thing. Yeah, right. Now, so really, February, March, if you want to beat the spring Rush, yeah. um, that's the time to put your house on the market. It is, and it's hard for some folks to think that because snow is generally flying in February right. Uh, right. in our area. So they think that that's a bad time, or they think holidays because it's, it's um, you know, we have the decorations up and it might not be a good time to show our property. It's really not the case. Right. Um, if you want to put your home on the market at any time during the year, you, you can. should. You can, right. Um, you just need to know what to expect and what buyers are out there. Uh, but, but definitely beat April 1st. You want to be on the market by March 1st. Okay. Now, um, I always wondered, the people that sell their house in the dead of winter when there's lots of snow on the ground and you can't really see what the neighborhood looks like, everything's, is that a plus or a minus to both the buyer and the seller? It is a caution for buyers. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of times uh, the weather does play a, a major impact in how a property shows. So we, yeah. you know, we joke um, that the best time to do a home inspection is when it's pouring rain out because <laughs> you can tell if there's any water issues. Right. Um, the, the snow can, can hide some things, yeah. uh, some imperfections. And that's why it's um, it's really difficult. And you want to, if you're on the buy side, give yourself some options to, to view the property again when yeah. the, the conditions are a little bit better. If you can. If you can. Yeah. That's the key. And, and you know, being flexible and, and understanding of what's going on is, yeah. is key as well. Right. And finally, let's just talk a little bit about um, realtors and mortgage companies. And like you see ads now that you can get a, a mortgage approved in 20 seconds on your phone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, People, we, we, like, can you speak to that as someone who's been in this industry yeah. for a long, long time? Yeah, there's something to be said about having uh, a professional that you can pick up the phone and talk to um, yeah. and explain your situation. Um, the online apps and things like that that are quick, um, they're looking at just some very uh, simple factors. Mm -hmm. um, and it's still subject to verification. Right. So typically when you talk to someone on the phone, they're asking you for that verification up front, mm -hmm. and they get the entire picture. And a lot of times they can talk to the, the bank or they can talk to the, whoever's lending the money um, about those factors that might be outside of what you see on black and white paper. Right. Um, so I think um, it's very, very important for them to talk about their situation, right. what the scenarios are available to right. them based on their income and what their, their um, other factors are for employment and let that professional guide them through it. Right. Because yeah. it doesn't cost you anything to talk it to someone. It doesn't. Right. And, and it's not binding either. Right. So you can talk to several uh, loan professionals. Right. They'll do what's called a soft credit pull. It won't impact your credit score. Yeah. And and they each have different programs. So mm -hmm. you want to you want to get as Shop much information around. as Absolutely. possible. Shop around. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And finally, people that are thinking about moving versus renovating or adding to their house, mm -hmm. has that changed at all? What advice you'd give? 
Yeah, um, right now the, the market is very strong for contractors. Uh, there's a lot of uh, home improvement going on. Yep. Um, but again, that cost of goods is, is up. It's still up. So yeah. if you were going to add an addition, you know, two years ago for $100,000, it yeah. might be 125000 today. Yep. And you should always factor what your return on that is. Right. So if you're doing something like an in-law improvement to your home, that's very specialized. Yep. And that might be a little bit more difficult to sell down the sure. road as opposed to doing your kitchen, your baths over. You right. generally get that return That people back. love. Yeah. yeah. You definitely want to look at yeah. what you're spending versus yeah. what you'll get back. And I just want, I've heard so many different answers to this. What, in your opinion, sells a house? Well, I know uh, everyone says location, location, yeah, location, yeah. but um, curb appeal and condition. Yeah. They curb really, you know, yeah. yeah, because people are a lot more aware of what it's going to take to redo something they don't like yeah. um, or keep it up. Right. And so uh, that, that really is a, a main yeah. factor. Condition. Excellent. Excellent advice. Excellent information, as always. Thank you thank so you. much. We'll Appreciate have you again it. in a few months Absolutely. in the spring. Thank Talk you. about the spring market. Can't wait. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did you miss Kingston's special town meeting held on November 13th? We created a government update summary to help you stay informed. Kingston's fall town meeting was a one night affair and headlining it was the decision to transfer $600,000 to the town's water enterprise fund to design and permit a new manganese plant at Grassy Hole. With one such facility already in place, the new treatment plant is meant to combat levels of manganese so high that dishwashers and laundry machines in the area have been damaged by them. It would reduce the load on three smaller wells that would not be covered by the new facility. And with the total figure for the plant's construction estimated at $7 million, the measure passed by a majority vote. With shark sightings becoming increasingly common on the South Shore as well as the Cape, town meeting members voted to pass a $20,000 measure to install shark detection buoys in Kingston Bay. The measure will be funded through mooring fees and excise taxes and garnered a ringing endorsement by one volunteer diver for the town harbor master. It's a breeding ground for sand tiger sharks. I've seen them, six footers. So for my safety, I'd appreciate this being done. Um, please, I don't feel like getting eaten. Also approved was the hiring of an agent to collect delinquent property taxes from local business owners after a contentious ruling in which a proposal to adjust the budget for the position from 30000 to 20000 was struck down. The town's finance committee and the board of selectmen recommended the measure on the basis that it had the potential to garner upwards of a quarter million dollars in back taxes. And the town accepted the donation of 12 acres of land along the Jones River from 19 Wapping Road, LLC. The land comes divided into two parcels, one to the conservation committee to be kept as open space, and the other to the board of selectmen for general public use. That's all for this look at Kingston's fall town meeting. For PAC-TV, I'm Keith Hughes. Adrea for Heroes celebrated its fifth anniversary with their Branches for the Brave Gala on November 30th at Hotel 1620 in Plymouth. Over 160 attendees joined together to support the organization's mission of providing custom support to military veterans in need of a helping hand and to celebrate five years of lifting burdens for men and women who have served our country. An outstanding partner award was presented to Nick Casalias, owner of REI Roofing, for their tremendous contribution of providing a free roof replacement for Susan and Michael McDonough, both of whom are veterans and who are in an urgent situation with their Holbrook home last year. Susan shared her experience with remarks at the event. A sustaining donor award was presented by Jesse Brown, co-founder of Hydrea for Heroes, to New England Wireless Association for their generous donor support over three years, totaling $135,000. Amy Belmore, managing director of Hydrea for Heroes, spoke about the organization's mission, growth, and impact of having served over 600 veterans over the past five years. She also announced that REI had just agreed to provide a second free roof replacement for a war World War II veteran in Middleborough. Additional speakers included HRH board members Laura Buckley, Megan Keller, and J.R. Pimentel, and Sally Harding, a gala committee member. With the help of ornament sales at the event that symbolized the type of services offered by H4H, the gala raised thousands of dollars to support Hydrea for Heroes' mission. To learn more about Hydrea for Heroes and their programs and support services, visit www.hydreaforheroes.org. As we are all aware, veterans have many challenges surrounding medical benefits and coverage. One of the gaps that is especially financially painful is out-of-pocket expenses. 
The Medic Now Foundation assists service members with out-of-pocket costs through its stipend program as a thank you for their service and will promote access through developing relationships with the healthcare community. The program, which is a military health care smart card system, is in the testing phase in advance of a 2019 pilot program which will be launched in Massachusetts. Joined by Foundation board members, President and Founder Michael Duggan, Media Liaison Nick Morganelli, as well as Plymouth Veterans Service Officer Roxanne Whitbeck and State Rep Matt Moratori, an emotional and grateful Marine Sergeant Donald Jesse and his wife Janet were honored for his service to our country over the Veterans Day weekend at Plymouth Town Hall. Sergeant Jesse was the recipient of the very first health care stipend awarded by the Medic Now Foundation. Still in its infancy and testing phase, this program promises to be a well-crafted and vetted program managed by a team of dedicated professionals with wide-ranging backgrounds in veterans' affairs, finance, law, and more. It is the plan to provide thousands of veterans throughout the country with this benefit in the very near future. The Medic Now Foundation is working hard to help military members receive the medical attention they deserve when and where they need it. More information can be found at medicnowfoundation.org. Pembroke Veterans Agent Robin Kernan served in the United States Army for five years and volunteered her time working with Veterans Affairs for another 10. PCM visited with Commander Kernan to learn more about her commitment to helping veterans and military families. I served in the United States Army for five years. Robin Kernan has dedicated much of her life to public service. I served in South Korea, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Fort Meade, Maryland, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And then um, I also deployed, while stationed at Bragg, I deployed um, Operation Noble Anvil, which was a NATO um, operation for Kosovo. And that took me into Europe. On this cool night at the end of October, she was being promoted to commander of the American Legion Post 143 in Pembroke, and her promotion is somewhat of a milestone. Kernan is the first woman to hold the position of commander of the American Legion Post 143. It's an honor that, you know, this, the, the Legion heirs have the confidence in me to proceed as the um, commander. It's. I don't, honestly, I really don't think of it as me being a woman. I just think it is that they have confidence in me to lead them um, into whatever the future holds for this post. We are strong, strong knit, you know, family. Um, I know that I can count on any one of these legionnaires. They have my back. But Kernan's service doesn't stop there. She's also the town's veteran agent. I put in an application, went through an interview process, and um, was appointed. Um, I was appointed May of 2017 and took the position in the office physically June of last year. A big part of my job is the disability claims, um, getting veterans signed up through the VA um, Boston healthcare system, and then through there if they need assistance with, you know, whether it's hearing loss or, you know, whatever they need. I'm there. Sometimes they just need to come in and talk to somebody. Like, hey, I'm experiencing this, or um, they need help with housing. You know, um, filling out applications for the housing authority. Um, sometimes they just need, you know, help understanding a letter that they might have received, and that's what I'm there for. Next year, under the leadership of Commander Kernan, the American Legion Post 143 turns 100 years old. I do it because I think it's important to support my fellow veterans, um, not only through the American Legion, which is volunteer, but as the veterans agent, they kind of go together in my, in my world, I guess. But, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that we're out here and we do some really great things. We support, we have the Boy Scout Troop 105 that we support. We support um, Cub Scout Pack 43. Um, you know, we help the community in any way that we can, and we just try to get out there and let them know that not only are we here veterans, but we're here for the town of Pembroke. Reporting for PAC TV Community News in Pembroke, I'm Walter Giacchetti. Silver Lake Regional High School staff, Laker TV students, and PAC TV combined efforts to create an appreciation video for visiting veterans, thanking them for their service and ongoing acts in keeping our country safe. Watch this heartwarming video of gratitude and testimonial.
Hi, my name is Melissa Fontaine and I'm the Social Studies Department Chairperson here at Silver Lake. It is the privilege of the Silver Lake Regional High School community to say thank you to America's veterans, but especially to those individuals who took the time to share their experiences with our students today. We appreciate you. My grandfather served in Vietnam and I greatly appreciate his service and thank you to all the veterans for coming today and speaking with everybody. My father, Peter Hooper, served in the Coast Guard for about 20 years and I am thankful for his service. I just want to say thank you to all the veterans on Veterans Day. My oldest brother is in the Army and he is EOD, which is Explosive Ordnance Division, so every day that he's doing his job, he's out there looking for and disarming bombs. So thank you to him and to all the veterans on Veterans Day. My grandpa was a veteran and he put his everyday life in risk for our country to defuse a bomb so that our country wouldn't get blown up or anywhere else like that. And on Veterans Day, I would just like to say thank you to all the veterans for putting their lives on the line for our freedoms. I have several uh, veterans in my family that I'd like to thank. First, my brother, who served in the Army for five years. My grandfather, who served in World War II on the island of Guam. My grandmother, who served in World War II as well on the island of Guam. My great uncle John, who served in the Navy during World War II. And uh, my great uncle Richard Valente, who served in the Navy and um, was killed in the attack on Pearl Harbor. He was on the ship, the Arizona, when it went down. So i just like to say thank you to everybody in my family and thank you to all the veterans out there who have served our country uh, to keep it free and safe for me and my children. We really appreciate it. I want to say thank you to all of the troops who have put their lives at risk for our freedoms and safety here in the U.S. And I want to let you all know that me and my friends are currently running a charity called Soldier for a Soldier in which we are trying to raise money to build a house to then donate to a veteran. I'm here to say thank you to the veterans today. Uh, Veterans Day means a lot to me. My grandfather served in the Korean War as an airplane mechanic for the U.S. Navy, and my uncle currently serves as a colonel in the U.S. Air Force, and I appreciate all that they've given and all they've sacrificed for their families and for all the veterans and the sacrifices that they've made. And I'd just like to say thank you to all the veterans for serving our country and keeping us safe. And I would just like to thank all the veterans for keeping us safe every day. And I would just like to thank all the veterans for their service for our country and for all the sacrifice for our great nation. I'm here to um, talk about my dad. My father is a veteran. He served in the Persian Gulf War in 1990 to 1991. He served when he was 50 years old. He's retired from the Army National Guard where he was a sergeant. Now he is part of the Honor Guard. When there's a fallen soldier and they're having a funeral for him or her, um, he attends the funeral as part of the Honor Guard where they fold the flag a special way and they present that to the family. So I just wanted to say happy Veterans Day to all the veterans and thank you for all of your service. Thank you for all of your time and sacrifices that you've made to make this country great. And I'd like to thank my Uncle Den for the service and everything he's done for my family. And I'm thankful that the veterans protect our freedom and risk their lives. I'd like to thank the men and women in uniform for their service to our country as well as their families for the sacrifices they make. In particular, I'd like to thank my dad, Thomas Ford, who's here with us today for his service. I would like to tell you something about my brother, Richard G. Salenzi. In 2011, I saw him at the U.S. Marine Corps in, in Paris Island. It's important to have veterans because they serve the United States of America. My grandfather served in Vietnam and I greatly appreciate it. And I would just like to thank my dad for his 20 years of service in the Coast Guard. Thank you to the veterans who participated in today and thank you to all of America's veterans. Uh, I also wanted to mention that I have a friend who lost a good friend of his in Iraq back in 2006 and he had asked me to purchase a license plate that supports Massachusetts Fallen Heroes. Also as a social studies teacher, I felt as though it was important because I teach a lot about the wars and the sacrifices that so many Americans have made for the freedom that we enjoy today that I wanted to do a little part in being able to support a cause that I found very worthwhile. So thanks again to the veterans and um, happy Veterans Day. I have three veterans who have served in my family. Grandfather Ebby, Grandfather Core, and Uncle Fran. 
I want to say thank you so much for serving our country and keeping us safe. I wanted to take this time to recognize my grandfather, Carmen Cash Castiano, for his time spent in the Vietnam War. He was a helicopter pilot and during one of his missions, it unfortunately went down and he suffered third degree burns on 25% of his body. I just wanted to say thank you, um, Papa, for everything that you've done over your lifetime and I'm very, very fortunate to still have you in our lives today because you're you're with us, you're able to spend time with us, and it's just a phenomenal thing that you did for our country. So I really thank you so much for everything that you've done. Hey Lakers, it's Madison Miller. Um, I was class of 2018. I'm currently a freshman at the United States Naval Academy, and I had the opportunity to participate in Silver Lake's first annual Veterans Appreciation Day and got to escort some of our community's veterans around last year. I'm proud to say that the students and faculty in my high school go out of their way to honor our community's veterans, and I really hope you guys can continue on this tradition for many more years to come. On behalf of the faculty at Silver Lake Regional High School, we want to say, Thank, thank you. you! Thank you for your service. Thank you. 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 Thank you! We're so pleased to welcome back on set Melissa Origi, who's the town manager for the town of Plymouth. Welcome back, Miss Melissa. Thank you. We haven't had you here in a while, so lots to catch up on. Anything significant came out of town meeting? We had a lot of great articles come out of town meeting. Fall town meeting is surprising because you do more business there than you used to in the past, do more capital projects. So yes, I think that there are many projects that have come out of fall town meeting. I'm embarrassed to admit a little bit we haven't completed all that follow-up yeah, yet. That's Sometimes okay. you're well into the next town meeting right. is still working on these projects. But I think that we did accomplish a lot and it was yeah. a positive town meeting. Absolutely. Uh, the waterfront, talk to me about the waterfront. There's so much happening down the waterfront. I feel like every time I come on the show, I talk about construction projects in this town, but mm -hmm. it's true. From yep. one end of the town to the other and the waterfront is no exception. You see how uh, DCR is working on their park right mm -hmm. now and it was a little invasive during the last events for Thanksgiving. But a it worked. Crowded. Yep. Um, it's going to be beautiful. Yeah. The same with Coles Hill as well as the project that the 400th yeah. is looking at yeah. um, doing at the top. So I think that we're going to see real improvements down there by next summer. In addition to the fact that we're working on the dredging. So yes. a lot of people are able to both see it yeah. and some of them are hearing it yeah. a little bit. They are working 24 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, this is what almost a sixteen million dollar project. Right. So How this, long does that project last? Oh, it's going to be a couple of years. Yeah, it really is. Um, I think that I don't want to say this early in the game. The schedule is looking really good right now. Yeah. So as long as they can keep that activity up, this is something that we will benefit from. Oh, absolutely. Um, within two years. Right. And it goes all through the uh, through the winter. They yes. don't stop. They will continue to work. And where does all the silt go? So there's different places that will bring the dredging material for the town of Plymouth. Once we do the local dredging allow Mayflower, around Mayflower 2, yeah. around that area, yeah. we'd like to bring all that material. Uh, we'd like to keep that in town mm -hmm. and bring it to our capped yep. landfill. Yep. Uh, we're still working on the permitting for that, but mm -hmm. I think that David Gould will make it happen. Yes, because that's very rich material that you're getting. Yeah, the, the material yeah. has, has some issues. Yeah. Dredging material does. It's not 100% clean, but I think if it's of a certain quality, yes, we'll be able to keep it. it in town. Absolutely. Um, now the dam, the Holmes Dam that David Gould's working on? Holmes Dam is a fantastic project. If you haven't had a chance to go down Summer Street, you really should because it's been destruction over the last um, month or so. Yeah. You just see all that, the dam coming down, you see the parking lot all ripped up, you see the skate park down. Mm -hmm. But David was saying in a recent meeting that now you're going to start to see the rebuilding of it right. and it's going to be lovely when it's done. Yeah. And he's working pretty closely with Public Works mm -hmm. because we'd like to go to Springtown meeting to do some more work at Jenny Grismill. Mm -hmm. And you will eventually, once we're able to do the lighting and the improvements and the changes in the new footbridge, you're going to be able to tie all this walking path together yeah. and it's going to be gorgeous. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Excellent. Um, maritime facility. What about this? So I feel like this is the David Gould show right now, but we are, <laughs> That's okay. we are working on uh, the maritime facility. We'll take that little old beautiful harbor master shack, which yes. I love and I think a lot of us have a soft spot for, yeah. and that will become um, both a storage area and we'll most likely have one of the harbor masters stationed there in the summer because yep. that's a very a good busy area. Yep. Um, and we will break ground on the new maritime facility. Mm -hmm. They're working on completing the plans now. And this surprised me, but that building will be up and functioning in 14 months. That really? seemed quick for the public sector, Yeah, but that is the schedule for it. And what, what's going to be in the building? 
Oh, so you will have transient bathrooms, which include laundry facilities, showers for all those weekend boaters that come in. Excellent. It, it, it will be um, it will be the envy, I think, of some of the other communities that haven't done this yet. Yeah. Where you want people to come and visit and stay for at least an overnight. Sure. It will have public restrooms, yep. which we always need more of, although yep. the ones at Town Hall have been very successful for mm -hmm. the events that we've had. And then, of course, it will have the Harbor Masters functions themselves yep. um, in a meeting room, Excellent. an education room. Excellent. And where exactly is this located, the new building? So the new building is in that section of land. It's hard to picture if you haven't looked at the maps of it, but it's in that section of land that is, um, go back to the state boat ramp parking lot yep. behind East Bay Grill. Yep. It's that strip of land that Perfect. is right there. Well, great location for it. Excellent. Um, lots of stuff about roofs and HVAC. Not the most the exciting, but this you know, is exciting. We have 32 public buildings. Yeah. Um, that doesn't count any of the schools. And like your homes, you know, you get 20 years or so mm -hmm. out of a roof. Your HVAC systems in these large buildings, they need to be upgraded. They're so complicated yeah. now. Even when we built the new town hall, as mm -hmm. we're building the new fire station, um, the new schools, building code alone requires you yeah. to build such sophisticated systems that. Your own staff isn't able to maintain these. This Absolutely. is something that you have to have a contract yep. for. So with the old HVAC systems, they need serious upgrades. Yeah. And I think it's hard when people look at a place like the police station yep. or the library. In many ways, when you look at the outside, it still looks beautiful and brand new. It sure. isn't. Right. So right. Um, it's expensive yeah. to do all these systems and upgrades. But it's something that in this budget, and I think... Starting last year and really over the next three or four years, we need to make a huge commitment that our budget has to be about protecting, preserving, and building um, our capital assets, what yep. we already own in this yep. community yep. and improving them, whether that is our parks, even if it means that we have to reduce the number, yep. whether it's our parks with mm -hmm. handicap accessibility and improving the playground equipment to the cemeteries that we have now, to the buildings, mm -hmm. um, we really need to make a better commitment to that, and we're going to try and work the budget around that theme over the next couple of years. And maintenance will be built into that so that you know when something has to be worked on. So before it breaks, you make sure it's fixed. Right. Yeah, we so we it's commit to it. Yeah, so we exactly. don't let those articles, we try really hard not to have those articles fail to meeting because we, we marry a schedule and then we keep to it. One right. of the biggest steps that we've taken in that direction is by hiring the new facilities manager. Mm -hmm. That took a while, a couple yeah. of years, for a town meeting to agree that something that needs to be done, but they do seem all in now. Oh, sure. So we'll start to, at this last town meeting, we're looking at uh, a new position which will provide for some HVAC Great. oversight yep. and an operations manager. Yep. I think you're going to see in future budgets that we get an electrician on board. Mm -hmm. Now, I do think we need to do a better job coordinating and sharing resources with the schools. Yes. But of course, they're busy too with right. their... Right. What is it, 12 schools now, yeah, so 12 yeah. buildings? Yeah, crazy. Including 11 Lincoln Street? That's what, so let's talk about that. So 11 Lincoln Street, which used to be your old town hall, used yeah. to be your home. Tell me all about the rehab and the redevelopment of that for the school department. You know, I have to give the school a lot of credit. They can be really impressive when they bring in students and some of the resources they have available to them through staff. If you get a chance to go through 11 Lincoln Street, not that it wasn't a beautiful building yep. when we were there, but it looks fantastic mm -hmm. inside. I think that the school is thriving on the basement level. I believe they've moved in facilities operations, school administration building, although they haven't left South Meadow Street yet. Yep. I think you're going to see them in 11 Lincoln Street by the spring. Mm -hmm. They've made some great improvements with putting walls up, yep. cleaning up the space. Yep. We tried to hold an auction and get rid of a lot of our old furniture yeah. that was in there. Wasn't as successful as we would have liked to yeah. see, so we do have to still do a clean out for them. Yeah. Now, what about the buildings and where they're currently housed? What is going to happen to those? The Oak Street site had facilities management in it from the schools. Yep. That building will uh, be put up for sale. Okay. Now, we did show it to the Chamber of Commerce recently yes. to see if they would have some interest in it, and I don't know what that looks like. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that would be some kind of lease. Yep. Certainly, they wouldn't have the kind of money to be able to purchase, purchase it. it. Right. However, is that a function that would work well there? Yep. Um, we are looking at going out for sale, lease, mm -hmm. or whatever that is, sometime in January. Really want to do it prior to December. Yeah. I just haven't been able to yeah. get to it. And then the South Meadow building, again, I think that there would be options to sell that. It's in a great area it for is. commercial development. Yep. But I have heard some rumblings that there may be a school that is interested in the site or a school function. Oh. So that would be something we could consider leasing to them. Absolutely. But we have to take a look at the dollar and cents on that first. Right. Right. Absolutely. Okay. 
Um, what else? Selling Oak Street. What are, what are we selling on Oak Street? So that's the school administration building that oh, I was just Oh, that's the one we were just talking about. Mentioning. Okay. okay. Um, it, now, the budget for 2019, how do we look? So the budget for 2019, we'll present it to the Board of Selectmen for the first time um, in about a week. Okay. From right now, we tried to concentrate that budget about all these improvements yes. to our existing resources. Of course, there's going to be a couple hiccups, yeah. like there always is. Mm -hmm. We have to make um, a tough decision on what to do about fire headquarters. Yeah. It is in worse shape than we thought. Of course, it's an older building. Right. It was a rehab building. I think it was like a bus function yep. years and years ago. It was built in the 70s. Yeah. We would need to invest a couple million dollars into headquarters. It's not handicap accessible. Yeah. It's not in a prime location. I think there is interest in possibilities of us to at least look at and brainstorm and debate whether the old water barn yep. is a good location for fire headquarters. It's a little smaller mm -hmm. landmass yep. than we would like, but it has some um, some options that could make sense. Absolutely. Response times, yeah. the actual location of it, putting a light in there, yep. the fact that South part of town is growing. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a little further away from where it is now, it could really work. And yep. there are some downsides to it yep. as well. And that's something that the board needs to debate. We'll start to hear about those things in the upcoming budget. Okay. So it never stops and it never ends. Oh, that's what we love about that's Plymouth, right. though. That's right. Thank you very much. That's we'll have it. You on We're again. done. Okay. We're done. We're done. Um, if you'd like to see the show again, you can find PAC TV Community News on YouTube and on our website. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook and to get any up-to-date info from all of us at PAC TV. Thank you for watching and have a great week.